Where is everybody today? We thought maybe the portals were down, but you're here, so those must be working. Oh, I didn't come through the portals. I fell asleep in the ice cream room. Again? Hey, everyone. I... Wow. Um, is my time steering off again? It's peak business hours. The portals might be down. Where's, Where's the, the unicorn? unicorn? This season of the Bug Hunters Cafe is made possible by Soft Terrific, Mousepaw Media, and Manning Publications. Nope. Nothing. And I thought for sure that would be the magic phrase to activate the portals. Maybe it was worth a try. Maybe we should just call them. Bug Hunters Cafe, this is Jess. Yes, the porters are down. And the unicorn appears to be missing today. No, the other ways here are still working. Yes, you're welcome. Hope to see you soon. Ah, and that's why I always take the train. Well, hey, it worked. <laughs> hey, Andrea. Hey, Naomi. It's a bit of a quiet day. The portals are down. Boyan, meet Andrea Goulet. Uh, she's the co-founder of Corgi Bites and Hardware and the community's legacy code rocks and empathy and tech and the author of the upcoming book Empathy Driven Software Development from Pearson. And of course, you know Naomi Cedar from before. Pleasure to meet you as well. Can I offer you a cup of empathic uh, coffee? It's in your oh, house. I love special. that. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Good boy, Naomi. Hey. Hello. Uh, Naomi, can I, can I get you anything to drink? Uh, yeah, as, as always, I'll just take a, a cappuccino. All right. Now go get that. And uh, yeah, sit anywhere. As you can see, the cafe is presently empty. <laughs> so we have the run of the place for the moment. Yeah. Didn't you used to have a uh, unicorn? We're supposed to. We can't find him anywhere today. It's rather, it's rather strange. <laughs> I'll have to check my daughter's room because she's she loves unicorns. But I told her that we weren't allowed to keep one because our town has an ordinance against livestock. But she's been trying to petition it, so so I'll I'll double check her place. Well, that's a common misconception. In unicorn law, you, unicorns are not uh, livestock; they are natural wonder. So, ah, gotcha. All right. Well, I'll let her know. And well, the legislation gets tricky there because if you allow them to having natural wonders in your house, next thing you know, someone has a geyser in their living room. <laughs> and that's a bad thing, how? <laughs> I'll get the coffee. <laughs> yeah. So, I have many questions. What is your favorite color uh, of unicorn? And why is it rainbow? <laughs> We stopped trying to understand Bojan a long time ago, Andrea. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, can I say glitter? My daughter has a shirt. My favorite color is glitter. And I'm like, I'm, I'm tapping into that vibe this morning. Yeah, I'd say glitter. Your daughter is a very wise person. Yes. <laughs> yes. Also, Jason told me you have a very specific uh, skill set. You know how to work with legacy code. And most developers I know, they're super scared of legacy code. You're not. Tell me your secrets. Well, it started when I um, reconnected with a friend from high school. His name's Scott. Scott Ford. M. Scott Ford, if you find him online. Yeah, and so we went to high school together, and he came up to me and said, I have a business. I'm not making a lot of money. My background's in marketing and communications. And he said, I want to fix bugs all day, and no one will let me. I was like, What? So he was working at large organizations. He's like, I really want to fix the issues and like make the code, the existing code better. But everyone wants me to keep building new features. And so the marketer in me, like the way to create a really good business that I learned was to find something that everybody needs and no one else wants to do. And I was like, well, there's a lot of existing code out there. <laughs> so if you want to do this thing, then awesome. I didn't know how to code at the time. But Scott told me that was okay. He told me I thought like a programmer because he had read my blog and the way I approached communication was very programmatic. So we started, I did a lot of the business stuff at first, but then learned along the way. So I'm self-taught. 
And it was interesting because, well, first of all, let's define legacy code, right? Like Michael Feathers' book um, is a hallmark of the industry, and that typically is code without tests, right? So automated tests are really important. But I define it as code without trust because you need to trust your team. You need to trust that the code is doing what you expect it to, right? You need to trust that the documentation that you're reading is accurate and will actually do what it says it's going to do. And so then we looked at different ways to build trust. And the other thing that we noticed was that shame is a big part of the software culture in general. Definitely was 12 years ago. I think it's getting a little bit better. And I was doing some research on Brene Brown and empathy because that was my background from communications and writing. You can't be a good writer in the business world unless you understand empathy on a technical level. And she was on Oprah one day and made a really interesting comment that shame needs three things to thrive. If you put it in a Petri dish, it'll grow exponentially if it has secrecy, silence, and judgment. I was like, whoa, that sounds like command and control culture. And so then she said, but the antidote is empathy. So if you put empathy in a Petri dish then shame can't grow. And so I think legacy code, there's a lot of shame around it. People are like, I don't want to touch it. Or even worse, being really critical and mean and contemptuous about the people whose work they've inherited. And Scott just never had that. He never, he's always just like had this respect for the work that came before. And so then we started thinking about, like, how can we redefine legacy code, right? And that's where the Legacy Code Rocks community came from. Because there's a lot of joy to be found in it. You're the steward of this piece of code for a little while. You get to pass it down. It's something that's valuable. It makes, typically, it's it's the thing that makes businesses or organizations run. So what an honor to be able to work on that. And there's a lot of joy to be found. On the podcast that I've done, there's like, we ask everybody at the end, what do you love about legacy code? And there's some interesting patterns people love that you never, you never work on the same thing twice. You're constantly challenged. Uh, You don't get bored. The human element of like tapping into who was the person who wrote this? What was their mindset at the time? A lot of people talk about thinking like an archaeologist and a detective and so getting to dive in. So there is a lot of joy to be found if we just get rid of the shame, right? And so the work that I'm doing now with hardware and with the book is let's take the contempt and the shame that is kind of the default and let's first turn it into curiosity, which is kind of neutral. So the idea is like if you're looking at a piece of code and you're like, ugh, who wrote this? What idiot would do it this way? right? We can say the same thing, not say idiot, but we can say, huh, I wonder who wrote this. What did they do? Right. And then and we what were they, that. what were they thinking? What was what were their they th- Yeah. What were they thinking? Exactly. And so it's just a shift in tone and a shift in, you know, you're overriding your initial sentiment, but that's something that neuroscience tells us that we can do. <laughs> it takes practice. And then we can go even further to compassion which is the act of desire to alleviate another person's suffering, which is not based out of your own personal distress. So a lot of times we act in a way because we feel stressed out or we want to alleviate our suffering. But if we can kind of put that to the side and genuinely want to make another person's life better, then we end up having the motivation to do the things that make code easy to work with. It motivates us to think about those those human people so so for example the I have a friend Taylor and you know when I was early in my career I was like oh alt tags okay fine I'll write it in right and I I knew that it was important but it felt like kind of a check the box activity and then my friend Taylor was in a car accident and he lost his sight and so he was like he was describing to me just like how important alt tags are for him to be able to navigate the web like effectively And so now when I think of an alt tag, I think of a human and I think of Taylor and I think about like, I want to make his life easier and better. And that gives me the motivation to do the thing that I knew I was always supposed to do, but was hard. So that's kind of the overview. And in the book and 
through the business, there's 12 different skills. They're kind of all interconnected when, when it comes to empathy. And the really interesting thing is that the more you look at it, the more it's like system architecture. <laughs> like we are people in the software industry who are really used to grappling with huge domains and big complex problems. And empathy absolutely is that. And so we can use those same skills of decomposition and, you know, knowing how to name things on the fly if you're using, you know, skills like duct typing, like all of those things also apply in empathy. And so that's been my world for the past several years is just finding these similarities and helping people understand that empathy can be operationalized. It doesn't have to be as squishy as, as we initially think it is. And that a lot of times our notions of what empathy is are wrong. Like a lot of the dictionaries even get it wrong. So, you know, I think that's kind of like software because a lot of people, if they don't code, it's like, oh, I don't know what that is. I'm, I'm scared of it. So, but empathy doesn't have to be scary and you learn how to implement it. So, yeah, it's fun <laughs> and different. Um, so... I'm kind of curious about something that came up while you were talking, and that is, it's easy to have that kind of attitude towards legacy code because many, many, many times you don't ever see or know the person that, that, that first touched it. Then that led me to think as you were continuing to talk about how a lot of the issues that we have interacting as tech communities are often blamed on the fact that it's really easy to type a flame when you never have to look that person in the eyes face to face and things like that. So, I mean, have you thought any, have you done anything in terms of applying that, not not just to maybe a software team, but to a community? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think, and there's a lot of different practices out there. Like one is that compassion is actually a skill that can be cultivated. So there's um, uh, Stanford, I think, has like cognitively based compassion training. Mm -hmm. um, there are skills that typically come from the Buddhist tradition, but they have been shown to be incredibly effective um, in the secular arena as well of loving kindness meditation. And the interesting thing is that you start with yourself. Self-compassion is critical. So you can't, it's kind of the, you can't, you have to put your own oxygen mask first. And I used to roll my eyes when I heard that. But we have a certain capacity. And like if we're burned out and we're stressed and all of that, like empathy just is really hard. Empathy is a really cognitively expensive activity. So by practicing kindness towards ourselves, by recognizing common humanity, by focusing on learning how to not jump to a place of judgment and that's these are skills right that, that get cultivated over time through practice then when you approach something it the default eventually becomes curiosity like okay what were they thinking but a lot of times it's just that we're trained to think this way and a lot of times that comes from the cultures that have been set up where it's incredibly competitive or you know shame-based management tactics for sure Right. So if we can get rid of the shame, then that aspect of being able to approach things with curiosity becomes easier. So the culture absolutely has a lot to do with it, too. This has come up a lot um, over the years mentoring interns because a lot of interns will come up with a solution and they're they're conscious of the fact that it's not as good as it can be. And the knee jerk reaction that many of them have is I'm ashamed of this code and I don't, you know, I don't want to share it yet. It's not perfect yet. You know, and I, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to show it. I don't want to post it. And so they just don't, don't post it. And one of the hurdles I have to overcome regularly is, well, hell, I was telling them, I said, if, if you don't read code you wrote six months ago and cringe a little bit, you're probably doing it wrong because we're always growing. We are always improving. But with that in mind, Go ahead and post it. Go ahead and share it because we all are always growing. And there's the code that you wrote, even if it's not what you have in mind, there's still value there. There's still something you got right. There's still something good. And I tried to point that out in the code review and they post it like, oh, I got all these things wrong. I'm like, OK, but let's stop for a moment and look at what you got right. This works. And this works. And this works. And uh, I actually just had a conversation 
yesterday with someone was like, well, I, I feel like this, this, you know, solution, I just, I went off on this rabbit trail. I was confused and I did this overcomplicated thing. And I said, well, it might be overcomplicated vis-a-vis these tools you didn't know you had. But if you were working in this different situation, if you're working with diff- this different tool set, actually, you just found the, the right answer. So give yourself credit. You just solved a difficult problem in a harder language. There's just an easier way to do it here. And reframing it like, break the build. Please break the build. We'll help you fix it. Please break the build. <laughs> <laughs> Encouraging mistakes. That can be challenging because people don't like, I don't like making mistakes. and I don't know anybody likes it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the culture plays in there, too, because if you're going to be shamed when you make a mistake or if no one else who you respect who's been there longer ever shows that they made a mistake, Mm. right, then, of course, people are going to be scared. I struggled with this when I first learned how to code because there's a lot of emphasis on clean code and elegant code and making things as, you know, intention revealing as possible, which is great. And I found like as a learner, um, they're coming from the writing world, like we're used to like Anne Lamott calls them shitty first drafts. And so like, but I never saw like proto code in action. Like it was something that people did in the books and it was like, this is good practice, but I didn't see it actually like happening. I saw kind of an idea of like, I'm going to get the most elegant thing possible is right off the bat. That's intimidating as somebody who's new because there is a process. What do you think, Naomi? What What have you seen in that? Uh, I, I think I think sadly in practice you're right. I mean, I tell my team uh, that that the steps should be make it work, make it correct, and then maybe make it fast and elegant. Uh, so, um, and I Lord knows I've certainly modeled enough naive solutions for them over the years. Uh, but yeah, I I would agree that that should be the ideal, and I don't know that. I think a problem is that a lot of people who are managing other coders have no idea what they're doing in terms of managing and teaching. And it's not their fault. I mean, that's because they've spent most of their time learning how to code, not how to teach. So this has been a long frustration of mine is that they then tend to fall back to whatever awful thing was done to them as what they Mm -hmm. do in the next generation. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, they get promoted from coder to manager and they don't have the well on, on the one hand that can be an advantage because I've seen some management courses and a lot of management courses to what you were saying, Andrea, shame based management, a lot of management courses teach the exact opposite of empathy. You know, mm-hmm. the worker is this inherently lazy, yep. sloth like, you know, microorganism that just doesn't just wants to get as much money as possible for as little work as possible, which is not true by and large, but that's the attitude that a lot of management courses come from. So you have that, but then you have developers who are suddenly promoted to manager, which I, I, that never made sense in this industry. When you're really good at your job, we're going to promote you out of what you're good at to something you have no experience in. And then those same developers are then exposed to that management training material. Mm-hmm of um you know treat the people like lazy people and so they start treating people like they would treat a badly implemented compiler yeah Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) it doesn't work i learned my management being a teacher in high school and middle school so i was i became really interested in motivation and things like that when i switched to the business world whenever i would say some of these things people would always say oh but you're a teacher I don't know what that meant, but apparently it meant I wasn't doing it right uh, in the business world. Yeah. Yeah. I drew mine from tutoring. So right there with you, Naomi. It's like, I almost almost wonder if teaching should be a prerequisite. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I went to business school. So, you know, in my classes, a lot of it was about widgets. Right. Like I, I didn't really, I didn't learn how to motivate teams. Um, and granted this was in the nineties, so it was a long time ago, but it was all about how, like, if you have X number of widgets, like how do you make them as efficiently as possible to maximize your profits? And, you know, Milton Friedman's economic policy of like, you know, shareholder maximization instead of stakeholder maximization, which 
you know, stakeholders are all of the people. It's your employees, it's your vendors, it's the community at large. But at the time it was like, nope, only thing that matters is maximizing profit. And so when I came to the agile world, literally nothing made sense. Like I felt like Alice in Wonderland because everything that I had learned, I was being told to do the opposite. And the thing that really like made my brain shift and I was like, oh, I get it is I read an article by Patrick Lencioni on first round review and it mapped kind of the shame, secrecy, silence, all of that. And it was like, no, here are the practical ways. Like you want things to be transparent, you know, all that. But then also I read this book, Team of Teams, um, by General uh, McChrystal. And he talked about how he took the U.S. Special Forces from a command and control to a decentralized management structure. So nothing to do with software. <laughs> But he had a really interesting thing in there because the, you know, you have X widget, run it through Y process, get Z result works in some situations where it's predictable. And like when I was writing websites, I knew like I need, I need to gather this information. I need to spend this much time doing it. And then I will provide my client with these deliverables. So being able to like do that efficiently was awesome but in a dynamic and complex environment completely breaks down and so i think that's the thing is what i also see is people are like waterfall is bad gantt charts are evil there's a place for them it's just not in a complex environment which software development 100 is so i think it's less about like trying to demonize or dogmatize any type of system and more about recognizing where it's appropriate, where it's going to be useful, where it's not. And that's when I was like, oh, now I get it. And so that's when we started implementing some of the operational practices and it really worked. Well, I mean, software's thought stuff. And that's that's the thing is like for years, especially the, throughout the 90s, they would always draw comparisons in the 80s and 90s between software and building bridges. And I think there's there's some there's something to be said for that because like there is a degree to where we, we plan like like you would plan a bridge you you know you you try to plan your, your software too. you don't just go in and go okay well let's just start putting stuff up but that's kind of where the analogy stops working because software is not it's an unmeasurable non-count noun mm -hmm. you can't say how long is this software how wide how how thick it's like it's 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 so wibbly wobbly tiny whiny mm -hmm. that you know as soon as you start engaging with Thought stuff. I think that's why waterfall gets tricky in software is just because, like you're saying, it's waterfall works well for concrete tangibles mm -hmm. widgets, but we're not building widgets. We're 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 building this nebulous sort of almost quasi living yeah medium. Yeah, uh, and so I think over the years, what I found is that a better analogy is to an ecosystem. Because what you're doing is you're trying to build something that's as resilient and sustainable as possible. And that's what we want to do with our ecosystems as well. So the definition that I have of empathy-driven development is that it's a human-centered approach to building software that uses effective communication to generate resilience and trust. So the idea is like the good communication is the thing you produce and code and communication are the same thing whether or not you're typing in a text editor or you're typing in Slack or like you're having a conversation, it's all the same thing. And you're focusing on the human, but the outcome is trust and resilience. And when we have those things, that's the unsaid requirement of Agile. Like if you go back and read the manifesto, it's like- I, Most people haven't. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's kind of where I started. But Agile isn't about two week rituals. And it's not about Jira tickets. It's about working together and creating the best thing you can and bring something to the market as fast as you can so that you can get fast feedback and you can provide value to all of the people you work with and your customers. And so it's all it's ultimately to me, Agile and Scrum is ultimately about creating psychological safety. And this is where I think most companies miss it. 
I, you know, pulling from the, the food world, Adriano Zumbo, the Australian patissier, um, he creates some absolutely incredible desserts. And, like, he's just this incredible, like, he's just got this scary. I think I you know, saw, like, a Netflix thing with him or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Zumbo's just desserts. Yeah. He, um, there was something that he said that I thought was really interesting. He said the the, um, he said, if your workspace is clear, that if your workspace is clean, then your work will be clean. And he also said never, he was also saying, and actually in that show, he was even saying, don't cook while emotionally compromised. <laughs> I don't know if it's the exact quote, but basically he's emphasizing that you have that your process and your psychological state have to both be clean for you to be able to produce your best work. And the same thing happens with code. You look at companies where you have lots of bugs in the output, you have lots of chaos, and you have a lot of stuff where they're going to have to call in Corgi Bytes later yeah. because there's all this chaos is because that, that chaos is coming from, I would argue, from the chaotic environment of the... And I can never remember the law, but it's been cited on every single episode of Conway's Law. Of Rocks ever Conway's Law. When there's a chaotic environment, you're going to get a chaotic yeah. and result in the code. It's not the fault of the person typing the code. They're trying to type it in the middle of the torture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so Conway's Law sa states that um, the architecture, the structure of a system will mirror the communication structure that was used to uphold it, which is part of the reason why communication is like the huge piece of empathy driven development. Because if we want resilient code bases, we have to start with resilient ways that we communicate about the system and then it'll kind of naturally be reflected. So have you seen that Naomi in your work that the code would kind of mirror the communication structures? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think that it also, I guess I would, I would hate to say, but I think it, it also can flow in the other direction. I'm thinking of one particular developer I worked with who personified a passive aggressive personality. And the code was also a problem that way. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I've heard that as well. And I think also a lot of the corporate structures aren't really interested in that sort of communication. So I think that's why in many cases, I mean, I lived through a shift to from waterfall to agile that to me really looked like they just took a marker and crossed out waterfall and wrote agile yep. under it. Uh, and, and it was it was that same sort of thing. Nothing really changed in the way that people acted. It was just the name that it got called. Mm -hmm. Zombie scrum. <laughs> yeah. There's a book called that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, we see that a lot, too. We actually, So when we started thinking about our operations, we intentionally rejected, like, we don't use the word agile when we talk about our project management style. We say that we implement practices that enable responsiveness and agility. And, like, that small shift, because agile is kind of a loaded term, so there's the way I've heard it at different agile conferences and stuff is there's big A agile, which is exactly what you're talking right. about, Naomi, which is the like, you know, kind of this juggernaut that's like, I'm going to come into your enterprise and like, we're going to do all this stuff. Yeah, and hire then, a scrum master. And exactly. yeah, right. And then fine. there's little A agile, which is like, you're actually able to be responsive. So sometimes it's Kanban, sometimes, you know, a flavor of scrum, sometimes it's and it, it's interesting, too, because if you go back and read Jeff Sutherland's book, um, is it doing twice the work in half the time, just where Scrum, the, at the very, very end, there's a sentence and calls it Shuha Ri, which comes from Judo, and talks about how this just gives you the description. That's Shu, which is do it exactly like I'm teaching you, right? Then there's Ha, which is you're going to start to realize that there are some things given your context won't work, right? And so you're going to start to notice how the system and the process interact. And then re is invent your own stuff. And no, I feel like the that's one of the most important pieces of the book, but it's one sentence at the very end and it's like everybody misses it. So it's like, you're allowed to invent your own stuff, 
but people feel shame, like they're scared they're going to mess up. And, you know, so culture has a lot to do with it. Yeah. So if you go back and read, it's in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that, that, that was, the, that was the number one tenet of Agile in the first place. Yep. Adapt, change it, adapt. I mean, we're, we're trying to do this at, at, at Mousepaw Media right now where we're trying to, we're trying to do Agile, but we're having to reinvent it every, every sprint right now. We're still trying to figure out how to do it. Cause like, okay, we have interns that are working six hours a week and they're all over the world and we can't actually get in person. So how do we do asynchronous in a way that's going to work for them? And how do we handle this? And, we're six hours a week. How long is a sprint? And we keep like looking at these things and go, hmm, let's try it this way. Okay, that didn't work. Let's try it this way. That worked. Let's keep doing that. And it's that adaptive yeah. thing. And if anybody, if any agile expert came in and looked, they would just go, oh, this is chaos. You should be doing it. But if we did it by the book, yeah, it wouldn't we work. Ha- because we're not like every other team. No team is like every other team. We did that. So this is like, so Corey Bites has been remote for nine years we started out as a remote culture because scott and i grew up we're in a tiny little small town and we're like we're not going to be able to build a business based on geography we, we're gonna have to so one of the first things that we did was we did asynchronous stand-ups where you post what you you know you post something in slack and just get it done by you know 10 a.m eastern if you can't like if you want to do it the night before fine like and we got so much flack when because <laughs> When we were first going to conferences, people were like, no, it has to be in person. And we're like, mm. and I was like, the communication person in me was like, no, that's just an informative meeting. You're not generating ideas from it. You're just giving a status report. So that's something that very well, like a retrospective, that needs to be synchronous. But yeah, we got and I'm like, we're still doing it because I'm like, this works. <laughs> and now a lot of people are doing it. <laughs> so yeah, it's interesting. I think holding... And experimenting, trying new things. But it's hard. Oh, yeah, it's you hard have- in a lot of businesses. And so I think the other thing is, like you were saying, Naomi, like as an individual contributor, if you are in an environment where it's really hard and you don't have that support, like don't blame yourself for the fault of the entire organization not being able to help you. Right. Well, and it's interesting, I think, um, having seen um, Scrum retrospectives and like the post-its of keep and do more of and all of that, um, people default to suggesting very, very tiny incremental things. Nobody ever says, you know, stop doing in-person stand-ups. Nobody would ever do that. I, I actually knew someone. Well, good for them. I mean, okay, so we got one in all of our acquaintance, maybe. I mean, that's, you know, because the whole environment sort of constrains what people think is on the table. Right. So, yeah, that that's an issue, I think, with some of mm-hmm. those things. Yeah. But, but, Boyan, you had interesting experience with stand-ups, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Uh, since I'm doing a bunch of consulting work, uh, the craziest uh, Scrum abomination that I had the joy to witness was one of the huge clients. They had uh, 50 people stand up every day. Ow. The business person in me is just like, that's such a waste of money. Like, Because <laughs> you don't just have the stand up, you also have the context switching. So you've got the 30 minutes before and then you've got an hour after. After. It's now, I, yeah. And then how long did they go? They were never 15 minutes, I bet. I think uh, one time it went uh, seven hours. What? <laughs> seven oh, hours just talking about what you're going to do and then not actually doing it? Wow. I, I, I made a snotty comment on Twitter a few months ago because I had I had spent an entire day in meetings, like with, with one client. The entire day was spent in meetings. I got maybe an hour of coding. And it was, it was just like piddly stuff. And I, I want to post it on Twitter. I said, software engineering is a field where you spend all day in meetings discussing what you would have built if you weren't spending all day in meetings. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think meetings are another thing where it's like people feel like they need them because you need to communicate this information. But knowing how to communicate it effectively, it, synchronous communication is not always the best. Yeah. Death by thousand to stand ups. Yeah. Well, and, and I I wonder if some of the some of the meetings. I mean, I I go between any any context, any context I'm working in. I go between feeling really really isolated and really really overwhelmed with too many people. 
And it's like what I value is somewhere in between where it's like I can have an idea. I can go tap someone on the shoulder and go, hey, what do you think of this thing I was thinking about doing? Oh, that's a good idea. Or no, I don't like that part. Okay, cool. How are you? I'm good. I'm pondering this. Oh, have you thought about this? Oh, yeah, there's such and such. Okay. And then we part ways. And then, you know, having, you know, a, a hundred of those little moments throughout the day, I think that's one of the challenges that we have with remote is that you wind up feeling really isolated. And then that almost drives you to have more meetings because you're like, well, I feel disconnected. I feel like I, I, I need another human being to hear me talk about spending an hour and a half trying to find that stupid semicolon. And, and of course the managers wind up picking up on this and they feel out of sync. And then somebody goes, we need more meetings. And then you wind up with a seven hour <laughs> stamped up. Um, we need to find some other ways of, of, of connecting, honestly. Mm-hmm. It takes intention. It takes a lot of intention. So, yeah. Ha! I told you the portal network ran on enthusiasm. You did it that. Hey guys, you fixed the portals? I think so. At least one. So what's the special today? We haven't really thought of anything yet today, except for 35% off any order from Manning Publications with the coupon code PODBUGHUNT21. Well, I'll take my usual then. Same here. By the way, did you ever find out what happened? No, and the unicorn is still missing. We checked the magical grove where he lives, but the fairies haven't seen him since yesterday. Maybe he's somewhere in the back rooms. We can go look. You're welcome to. Just don't get lost yourselves. So, Naomi, you were just telling me about the most wonderful thing ever. Can you just uh, repeat it for Jason? I totally got everything you said. Ah, well, um, how shall I I say? I mean, I... I think that uh, we were talking a little bit about how I gave the keynote at PyCon a couple weeks ago, and that was a lot of fun. So, um, and I was a little bit nervous about doing it, but in fact, it went over pretty well. I was trying to argue that open source software is a gift economy. And I think I probably succeeded in making people think that. So that was, that was my success. For those of us for whom it's been too long since economics, Define gift economy. Well, that's an interesting thing because um, there again, I suppose, kind of like like uh, agile. There are lots of people who think they know what it is, and then there are other people who think maybe they know better what it is. Um, and um, to back up, we're all familiar with we use sort of a market exchange economy now. We exchange things for a specific value using this convenient fiction money. I mean, money is now more imaginary than it ever was, but it was really always imaginary. Uh, and, um, you know, everything has a value and we match values and that's, that's it. And um, in a gift, it's actually, I, I hesitate to use the word economy, in a gift culture, uh, basically things are more held in common. And if... Um, you need some shoes, say, and one member in your family knows somebody else who maybe has shoes, they say, oh, sure, here you can have some. And then maybe at a later date, they say, but hey, we're looking for something to feed people when they come over for dinner next week. And you say, well, here, we've grown this thing or we've got this, and so you can have it. So basically, the idea is that you know, everybody in the group contributes what they can, when they can, and one way or another, people sort of try to get what they need at the time. And it's sort of, it's assumed that everybody is kind of involved in this exchange. And that's, that's kind of an oversimplification. And there are various, various elaborations on that. But the idea is, nobody knows for sure what they owe anybody else exactly, because that question doesn't even make sense in that kind of environment everybody is kind of entangled and doing their best 
to get all of these resources together. So, you know, hunter gatherer cultures and and things like that have done that. I mean, uh, as I as I like to say, it's what the animals had on Animal Farm until the pigs turned into totalitarian dictators. Uh, so, you know, it's it's that sort of thing where there's a common good that people are all contributing to and all sharing it. So I was arguing that maybe thinking of the open source software ecosystem in that way, maybe would help people have a little bit more clarity in what they're doing and what they're contributing and what they might expect and how they might think that things should work. Because there's a lot of pressure in open source these days, I would argue, to be like a business. And that will be the most destructive thing that an open source community can do is try to become a business, in my opinion. Mm. That's interesting, but it's also making me think. It's interesting. I'm remembering recently that there was the guy who created a couple of major node packages for, for, for some things. And a few months ago, he had a bit of a... Right. Um, went off on a bit of a tirade and destroyed the code base and whatever, you know, basically malware the, the whole lot. He's like, well, it's because these evil corporations are using my code. And I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, speaking to the gift economy thing, people are forgetting that, like, corporations aren't just being evil by using the code. Usership is itself a contribution because you are testing it. You're, you, you know, right. as somebody who's written things that has very few users, it's hard when you don't have users because it, because then you can't get feedback. You don't get, you don't get, and the, 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 these corporations that are using it are contributing bug reports are contributing fixes. They're contributing, you know, improvements. And then they're folding it into, yes, they're folding it into some of their own products that can't always practically speaking, can't always be open source, but they're full, you know, so free software is, is permeating more and more of what used to be a very walled garden and it's improving the security for everyone involved. But then these companies are coming back around and they're pouring resources and time and money into these projects. Look at Microsoft and Python. Right. I think people are forgetting that we have that symbiotic relationship that we were aspiring to in the 1990s. Well, I mean, I think I think part of it is that we don't have as much of that relationship as we would like. I mean, if, if somebody can go and take code and create a startup or or maybe more importantly take open source code and replace systems they were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for and then maybe do a ten thousand dollar sponsorship for a conference or something that's that's not the same thing so there there's a real problem meshing those two worlds i mean you know looking at it from from the point of view of you know having been on the on the psf and all of that my view is we should do more to bring those companies those entities into the open source model if we can sell them on the benefits of becoming more of a participant whether that's giving money whether that's allowing developers to work without being subject to command control uh corporate uh, governance, what you know, however that might be, that's the challenge I think that we face for the major open source projects, um, the ones that that are used now by by so many people. They 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 almost can't be allowed to fail or or things like that. Uh, again, on Twitter the other day, I saw the XKCD thing I with the whole pile that. of blocks and the one thing maintained yes. by the guy in Nebraska. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I'm from Nebraska, so it's like I was picked up. Yeah, that's you. <laughs> Never it's know who it is. Uh, but uh, haven't been there in years. But yeah, it's um, so. Yeah, that's the challenge. I think is kind of meshing those two things, because we're in a mindset where we we tend to let the quantitative business exchange thing just roll over everything, and yeah. I don't think that's healthy. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, so for me, I, I just always think in systems and I love just learning about different domains. And so a while ago, I took up, <laughs> I forget if I read a book, I like listened to a series of lectures, but it was essentially about like, how did currencies develop? Like, why do we use money? And the overarching theme was that any currency is just a representation of trust. Because I barter something 
I'm giving you four bushels of apples for two chickens. And I trust that the chickens that you give me are healthy and will lay eggs, right? Like, and then, you know, you move to coins and it's like, okay, I trust that you haven't like put this with, you know, something and the value is what it is. And then the leap to paper money actually was in China in like the middle ages, which is fascinating. Um, But it's a system of trust. Like I trust that I can go to the bank or I trust that I can go to a store. And so when we look at this way, like the gift economy, it's like, what's the trust, right? And then I think if we look at it in terms of trust, then it becomes less liminal. And because liminal spaces are always hard. And like you were saying, it's like, okay, business who it would be really exhausting to have to like navigate every single thing, like a transaction where it's like, okay, you give me money and that's efficient for that set of structures. I agree a hundred percent that like open source, I love the way you phrased it as a gift economy because it's, I trust that, you know, my contributions are going to make a difference and that I'm getting skills out of it or, you know, whatever, but it's like, what's, what's the tr- GitHub squares? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have squares or like, whatever. I trust that, you know, I'll be able to use this or, you know, I, I just, I care about, you know, the, the viability and the ecosystem, or I use this on my project and I have a vested interest in making sure that it stays healthy. I think the big thing is making sure that maintainers are able to make a living. Absolutely. I went, I went to, I went to a conference several years ago about me and it was all open source maintainers. And like, that was the number one thing is that it's like, it costs money to manage a project and lead a project. And we can't exhaust people to the point where they can't pay their bills or expect it. So it's like, okay, if you are in the transaction based space, the thing that you can give that is a gift is money. If you are in the, I have more time, the gift that you can give is your contribution and recognizing that. Yeah. I think neither one of them is necessarily better than the other because we need all of it. And so, I don't know, I'm, I'm part of like the, can we just get to Star Trek's universe? <laughs> there you go. Or, there you go. Like, like I just want to live on next gen ship. I want to live on the enterprise where like, we're just all doing the thing that we love and like currency is no longer a thing. And you know, I, yeah, it, it feels aspirational, but when you look at it in terms of trust and then it's like, it moves to legacy code too. It's, it's like, that's the thing that permeates everything in a social system. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's weird to the, we're having this conversation about currency. It overlaps in a bizarre way with this whole ongoing debate about crypto and NFT and this whole new wave of new currencies. It's more imaginary exactly. money. <laughs> well, and the worst part is, is like that's just, you know, and I swear this is going to be relevant, but that's descending into a whole bunch of neo Ponzi schemes. Like how many NFT startups turned out just to be shells? How many people are getting totally ripped off? Because, okay, well, I mean, it's technically sound. Yeah, there's a blockchain, but there's the, the, the trust in the person who built that, well, you know, the trust behind that blockchain and that particular blockchain is misplaced in some cases. But I find it interesting because there seems to be an overlap between the what's being referred to as the crypto bro culture, which is a the kind of the latest flavor of toxic masculinity. <laughs> And there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of people in tech that are complaining like this is the latest breed of toxic masculinity. But there's a striking overlap between that and this one subset in open source that seems to be more along the lines of you need to prove that you have the right to be here. And they bill it as a as a meritocracy, but it's kind of a rigged meritocracy. And there's this weird this so there's this yeah. weird overlap between those two there's, between those two issues. There's a lot of evidence that meritocracies aren't a thing. <laughs> Like, well, and, and the whole oh, who assesses the merit? The whole open source thing, actually, as I was doing research, I went back and looked at that. I mean, the theory behind open source that was popular 20 years ago when I started is really, when you look at it now, just sort of Ayn Rand meets an adolescent fantasy 
there's there's really not much to it. It's like everybody is self-interested and they're so self-interested that somehow this is going to result in the best of all possible worlds. It's like mm, Stallman, St- Stallman S kind of. Yeah, yeah. Stallman and, and Raymond. And it's like you read that. It's like, no, this, this is not even how people work, really. No, no, no. no. I mean, it's interesting because the aspirations outlined in the Cathedral of the Bazaar, we achieved those. And yet somehow it's not the utopia that we expect. Well, I mean, it never will be. It's like if, if you read it, it's just it doesn't even describe people to me. I mean, th- there's no idea of altruism other than that you can con- congratulate yourself on how wonderful you are. It's yeah. the only motivation for altruism yeah. in that book. It's just it's funny. So altruism is one of the aspects of the empathy system architecture. And when I was diving into that one, OMG, it's so fascinating. So altruism can go really wrong. And there's a woman who researches pathological altruism. Her name's Barbara Oakley. She's written a book about it. And the idea is that we can think that we're operating on behalf of others, but really what we're doing is we're hurting people. So an example is I love my in-group or, you know, whatever that is. It can be an identity group. It can be a nationality. It can be familial I love them so much. I'm willing to hurt you to protect them. Mm. Right. But mob, basically how the mob ran. Right. And so if you look at like all of the atrocities, like the Holocaust, eugenics, like she describes that, like every single one of those, if you go all the way back, it's rooted in altruism. It's rooted in I'm trying to help somebody, but it's like really misinformed and you're hurting so many people. And, and there's interesting physiological stuff around this, too. Like, oxytocin is the drug that, like, when you know, it, it's sometimes called the cuddle drug, right? Where it's like, oh, it makes us feel good and things like that. Well, if you have that drug coursing, but you're also in times of stress where testosterone and adrenaline, norepinephrine and other, then the counteraction is violence, Because you care. And that's the physiological aspect of it, of like, I care about these, my group. And so you, what ends up happening is it's called intra-group bias. And this is the root of all of the polarization that we see of, I'm going to label you as not even a human. I'm not even going to think of you. I'm just going to call you a label so that I don't have to think about your humanity. And so this is where the compassion aspect of it comes in. You're not operating out of a personal distress. You're not operating out of a place of, I want to protect this person, but hurt this person, right? And that's actually what motivates it. And so it gets really fascinating really quick. And it's interesting you mentioned Ayn Rand. So when I was, I had an incredibly abusive relationship that I had to escape. And at the library, there was an essay by her called The Virtue of Selfishness. I was like, huh, that's really interesting. Maybe I should read that. And it was really powerful to me. And I think that like, I can say this piece of work was powerful, but then also there's, I'm sure there's people who are like now making assumptions about my political beliefs and like what I think. And I'm like, nope, nope, nope. (laughs) I was in a situation where I was a complete doormat and I had zero boundaries. And having someone say, you matter, and, and in that, what she was writing about was the idea of martyrdom because altruism had become like, if you don't give everything of yourself, mm-hmm. then you're awful and you're going to go to hell and you're not going to have a place in society. Yeah. That, and that so, classic, there's no I in team until some, some really clever person went, no, but there's a me. Yeah. And so the thing is, it's like, it's all about balance. You have to take yes. care of both yourself. Like there's fascinating research by Adam Grant from Wharton. Um, he's a good book called give and take. And it's like people who have a propensity to give. So like you were talking about the gift economy are both the most successful and the least successful person across all domains. Uh, but for a gift economy to function, you have to also take. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Exactly. You have to take Otherwise care of yourself you burn out. good boundaries. Yeah. So, yeah, boundaries is another piece of that. So it's like when you can learn all of these different skills, it's like, no, it's not about me being a doormat and giving, 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 giving to the point of exhaustion. It's recognizing I can give this and it will be valuable and it's not going to cost me so much. Maybe a, a little bit, but recognizing your own self first and recognizing, like, where are you injecting your bias and where are you harming others in an unintentionally? So sorry to well, and one, one rant, of, but it's like. 
oh, no, you're fine. But it, it reminds me in turn of there's an analogy that's sometimes um, given for the doctors will give people with like MS or fibromyalgia or other other conditions where you have very limited energy. Is it spoon? You do stuff. But you could, yeah, the spoons, or as it was explained, my 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 mother was 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 the marbles, mm-hmm. um, and I like it because like you have a certain number of spoons or marbles, whatever currency. Insert there we go, currency again. Well, I'll use marbles because one I'm familiar with. You have a certain number of energy marbles, and you can spend those however you like. But when you're out, you're out. You have to literally start budgeting your energy like you would your checkbook yep. and go, okay, I only have 10 marbles available to me today and I still have to eat. I still have to, you know, dust my office. I still have to, you know, go to the cafe. I still have all these things. So you have to budget it out and go, hmm, I don't have the time to do this. So somebody yeah. says, can you do this thing? I'm like, I'd love to, but I just literally don't have the energy marbles right now. Come back to me in, you know, six months. Yeah. I literally have a jar of pennies upstairs. And there have been times that I will actually, like, each one of those pennies represents 15 minutes. Yeah. And I'm just going through it like, okay, this is, here's my budget for the day. Yeah. This is where my time goes. Yeah. I have major depression. And, like, you know, I think, every, like, if you were to take the full marble, it's like, for, for someone who's not in a depressive episode, going and taking a shower is, like, one marble. For me, it's ninety percent of the jar. Yeah. And it's like, well, that, and that's yeah, because you have to, to just like get out of bed and take a shower when it's when it's hard. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's not really that it costs more so much as it it, it doesn't cost more in in in, in its own because I, I get that too. It's like it, it's not so much that this particular activity is suddenly so very hard for me. It's that I've already spent most of my marbles mm-hmm. just living. So like I've I've already put ninety nine of my marbles into breathing mm-hmm. because I I don't want to get up I don't want to be part of the world today and so I poured all this energy into just making myself get out of bed and now I have to take a shower well there's my last marble mm-hmm. I'm gonna take a shower I'm gonna go back to bed I'm sorry I'm mm-hmm. not here today <laughs> yeah and then I think the the piece of that is that there's an aspect of the culture of a transactional culture that the most important thing that you can contribute is productivity, right? And so if you have to spend all of your marbles being in bed to rest and restore, well, you have wasted everybody else's time rather than recognizing, you know, I'm I'm doing this so that I can move through. And it's interesting. I've had some of my best creative breakthroughs when my body is just like, nope, you are going to stay in bed for a month and all you can do is think. And so recognizing there, there can be, you know, but it's really hard. Like, I think that's why I own my own businesses, because I don't think I would be able to work in an organization where if, you know, when these things hit that they, I mean, it would be very disruptive in a, in a traditional organization. So finding that balance again, it's, it's hard. I, I would argue, you know, like you mentioned the toxic productivity culture, but I would argue that, you know, productivity is the best thing we can contribute but we have to it's the way it's framed is usually short-term thinking it's like well productivity right now it's like well it doesn't have to be right now if it takes you know like i'm sure plenty of people could could uh, could complain about victor hugo um you know like look how long it took to write his books and yet he finished them and look at the long-term contribution to society who cares if Victor Hugo had a few months where he couldn't do a ton of work on his book? And I, I don't know much about his life history, but I can guarantee there will be periods that he would not be doing any writing because I'm a writer myself. You have to go through dry periods. But it doesn't matter because the end result, his life work, his life contribution was so impactful. There you go. Les Miserables is so impactful that nobody cares that Victor Hugo had, a, you know, what would, would have, you know, a dry spell here. It doesn't. And I think if we start framing it in that way and start framing our contributions to like, even in the open source world. Okay. So I don't, I I can't do anything today. I can't move this project forward this month, but I'm investing in myself so that ultimately my end contribution, like my, my life's work is this, then you've still made this huge contribution vis-a-vis, okay, I've done all these little things and I've been toxically busy, but it's all just kind of going down the drain. I think it's also individual productivity versus collective productivity, right? Because 
not all contributions look the same. Some contributions are teeny, teeny, tiny and don't add a lot of value. Some of them are, you know, in a retrospective and saying, we need to change completely everything. You know, if you look at it, that took less time, but it can have a bigger impact. So, you know, recognizing those too. This is fun. I miss uh, philosophizing and geeking out. I've been in my brain for 18 months just trying to write this book. So, <sighs> yeah. But now I'm, I'm getting back out into the world and talking to people again. It's giving me so much energy. I love it. So thank you all for taking time on the Saturday. To <laughs> yeah. I feel that I'm in, I'm in galley edits for mine. And so it's like crawling out from under the rock and blinking in sunlight and going, oh, there's people out here. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you this has been lovely and it's good to see people trickling back in now that the portals are working again yes it's great yes and don't forget to tell your daughter that glitter is now also uh my favorite color glitter is your favorite color i did not know that was an option and i'm taking that love it and at this point of the proceedings i will point out there is such a thing as edible glitter there is Yes, I've used them for cupcakes before. Yes. Fine. Jason, if you're lying to me, you're going to get uh, incredible surprise glitter. Yeah, no, no, the, I'm not lying. There is edible glitter. And uh, hey, maybe, 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 we should, maybe we should add a glitter latte to the menu. <laughs> there you go. Yes. <gasps> there was a, um, where I am, there's a little uh, breakfast kind of mom and pop place and everything's around the B-52s. And so on the menu, and so they have one glitter on the mattress, and it's French toast with edible glitter on it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now Boyan wants to go there. It's delicious. We should have the next next one there. See if the portals can head over there. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we can always just hop in my coat closet. It goes anywhere. There you go. <laughs> Oh, thank y'all. This has been fun. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Thank you. Welcome to Scafe. This is Jess. Yes, the portal system is back online. And of course, we're open 24-7 at bargunters.cafe. You can also find us on Twitter as Bargunters Cafe. Yes, our music is provided by audionoptics.com. We have a link on our website. Oh, absolutely. We will be giving away more books from many publications in the fall. Yes, see you soon. Well, we found the unicorn. Um, is he okay? Oh, yes. He was binge watching all nine seasons of his favorite cartoon all night, lost track of time, and then fell asleep. That still doesn't explain the portals going down. Yeah, he also drank 16 gallons of soda. Sugar crash. Uh huh, no messy. <clears throat> well, don't complain to me about your life choices. Mm-hmm.